Hi, this is Rich Eisen, the host of The Open Mic, Writers in Their Own Words, giving you a little heads up on what our show is today. I'll be talking with an old friend and colleague, Ed Fletcher, a longtime reporter with the Sacramento Bee, who has uh, transformed his writing skills to the film arena. Uh, in short, he is working on a script that he wrote uh, on uh, an issue that happened here in Sacramento many, many years ago that he's turned into a documentary film. So we're gonna be talking to him today about uh, how he goes about transferring those skills he learned as a reporter into this arena as a filmmaker. Should be really interesting, stay tuned. Well, hello everyone, welcome again to The Open Mic, the show where every week I talk to writers, editors, agents, and others from the publishing world uh, to learn about them and the work that they do uh, in this very uh, sometimes treacherous, often fun, always interesting game that we play. Uh, I'm your host, Rich Eisen, and today I'm going in a slightly different direction uh, than we normally do here on The Open Mic in that um, I am talking to somebody who is, of course, an exceptional writer, uh, but he's not here to talk about a book. He's here to talk about uh, an independent film that he has written and is producing. Um, he's turned, he's taken his talents from journalism to filmmaking. Uh, please welcome uh, an old friend and colleague, a uh, longtime reporter of the Sacramento Bee, uh, Ed Fletcher. How are you doing today, Ed? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excited to, to talk about our, our project. Great. Well, I am too. Let's get right into it. Um, so tell me about the film you're working on, uh, which is based on events that happened here in Northern California uh, way back in, in the 1960s, correct? Give us, give us the, the rundown on what the film is. Yeah, so this is actually a, a documentary film, and I don't know if this has changed in the course of since we've talked, but uh, the first process in this was was writing it as a short and then I wrote it as a feature film and then um 2015 Carol Dota died and we decided to like no we need to get some of these people on camera and we shifted gears into doing a documentary so this documentary it's called do the dance and it's about a 1969 trial that helped set the rules for exotic dance in California and really uh, across the country 1969, the dancers at a, uh, I guess we'll call it a strip club, but more it's really kind of a beer bar in Orangevale called the Pink Pussycat, decided it was within their First Amendment rights to dance fully nude. They do so and get arrested that summer. They actually get arrested seven times before it goes to trial. And then the trial sort of became noteworthy and an inter international sort of conversation piece when Judge Earl Warren Jr. decided the jury needed to see the dance um, and he decided like, let the dancers do the dance and we'll let the jury decide whether that violates community standards. This whole thing is so fascinating to me because I have a hard time even imagining a, uh, a, a judge, much less somebody with the legacy of Earl Warren uh, Jr. saying, sure, let us go and watch a, uh, a full nudity striptease dance as part of a, of a trial that I can see why you were interested in this as uh, a subject matter. Where are you in the production? Um, I know that, he, that no film comes together easily. They're always a process. I, it's, I know it's the case in this, in this situation too. Where are you at in production? So depends on some variables, but we're probably 70% uh, to two thirds of the film shot. And uh, we're, we're now in a phase where we we had started towards, um, we, we were in the middle of production, COVID happened, and we were not sort of on the fence, but you know, looking at this daunting task of trying to raise the rest of the funds we need to finish the documentary and then get it out into the world. Um, and along the way, we, um, pitched and created a relationship with Fremantle Media, a uh, internationally based uh, television production company. Uh, they're looking to get into premium documentaries. So we now have a shopping agreement 
with them where they have one year to shop this to the major networks or, or wherever. And, and then the, the three of us consummate a relationship that agrees to distribute and produce and finish the, the project. Well, I mean, that's certainly uh, some several steps ahead from where we started. And, and just for a little background, um, both of us were in a class, a film writing class. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I didn't even realize going in that we were going to have to write a screenplay and enter it into a contest. So um, I was a little naive. I just wanted to to exercise that muscle, so to speak, you know, because as a reporter, you know, for all these years, it's all I've been writing was, was, was nonfiction. And so um, I'm very impressed that out of all of that, you, you have really stayed st stuck with this through a lot of trials and tribulations, uh, ups and downs. Uh, like I say, you started out as a, as a short fiction uh, project and now it's become a documentary and you're, you can see the end here, right? You can, you can see the conclusion here. That has to feel fabulous after all this time and effort. I, I don't know that we can see the, the end yet, but we can see that there is an end. Um, and we and we do have um, substantial um, players in the game that that now have an interest in this project and, um, and and believe that it was a national story once and we can turn this into a national story and conversation again and uh, and, and do something significant with it. So it's exciting to, to have gone as far as, as we have, but um, it still feels like there's, there's a lot of steps uh, to cross yet. Well, you know, uh, sometimes time, you know, of course, timing is always everything, not sometimes, timing is always everything. And it seems like um, as parts of the country start to, it feels like they're starting to lurch backwards uh, on a lot of social issues, it feels like the timing could be really a lot better now than it would have been even a couple of years ago if this had come out because of that. You know, there does seem to be a real question about people's civil rights and our and our basic freedoms, certainly in some states where they seem to be taking a much more aggressive look at human behavior and, and uh, that kind of thing. So maybe in this particular case, uh, you know, the timing will work out in your favor. I mean, um, has, has anyone, have you guys talked about that at all in looking at this? Uh, you know, that there, there, you may actually be creating a market, there may, a market may be getting created for you that wasn't gonna even be there a couple of years ago? To a certain extent, I, I do think you're right that, uh, you know, while we envisioned finishing this in time for the 50th anniversary of it, um, as forces try to take rights away from women and, and people, um, in the South and, and elsewhere, um, the story and this conversation about um, First Amendment rights and, and, for, and autonomy, rights of autonomy, rights of self-determination become um, even more relevant. Um, in the documentary, it starts off about this trial, but then we sort of spin it forward to talk about what's changed and what hasn't changed since then, and a broader look at um, the, the limits of sexual expression or free expression in America. And, and I think by proxy, I think we're also talking about uh, the, the right to an abortion and, and women's rights in that vein as well. Yeah, I, and, and thank you. You answered it much better than I asked the question. Um, and of course, as I noted, you were a reporter for, for many years with the Sacramento Bee. And, you know, of course, in that, as all reporters do in dealing with um, nonfiction, I'm always curious about uh, taking the skills that we have as reporters and applying them other places. As you noted, for a while you were doing this as a fiction piece, but now you, you've uh, turned back uh, to uh, nonfiction in the form of documentary. All these transitions, have you struggled at all with um, taking the mindset and the skill set that you had as a reporter and going through all these shifts? I mean, how has all of that played out for you? Um, I'm, I'm not sure which way to answer your, your question, but um, I, I do find myself 
where our our instincts as a journalist is to say that like I'm going to get both sides of this. And when I describe the documentary, everybody wants to know, well, what's your take on it? What's your angle on it? Because I think more and more we're seeing more documentaries where the the author takes a, a stance and the documentary is a thesis to prove that. Um, whereas journalism would teach us, let's get both sides in the room and, and have this conversation out. Yeah. But um, in, in reality, um, we do sort of paint the a picture with who we talk to and and we do perform the job of, of editing that film so we're we're in the the driver's seat uh, regardless of whether or not we want to try to say that this is a um objective journalistic piece um we're certainly have a a, a stance in that I, I don't know if that answers your question or not no, it does. And, and again, I think you're answering them better than I'm asking them in the short version here. I, you know, because that really is the question is, you know, as a reporter, you know, you don't have a position. That's the whole thing. You're just, it's just the facts. You're just laying it out there, hopefully in an interesting way, but always, uh, you know, accurately and fairly. And yes, uh, even though at times it seems like, you know, the both sides aspect of our job almost harms us from telling the story accurately. Because as we've seen in recent years, sometimes there's a side of the story that is a, that is a lie. And just because the, the, there's somebody on a side of an issue that's opposite of somebody else on the side of an issue, that doesn't mean they're telling the truth. And that puts us in a terrible position a lot of the time. At least in this particular situation, you may be taking a position, but it, I, it seems like the, the dichotomy is actually less than it is for a lot of reporters on the ground these days, certainly covering politics and yeah. you know things like that. Um, you know, there's there's also there's so many aspects of writing, and newspapers and films are very very different. Um, just from, just from the writing aspect, how has the transition been for you? Um, did you find it to be a difficult transition? Was it something you'd been working on for a long time before you took this step? Uh, how was that process for you? And yeah, I ask I, this because a lot of writers have the concept in their head that, oh, I'll just write a screenplay. <laughs> just like they'll just kick it out of screen. Oh, well, you know, I'll, if there's nothing else, write it as a screenplay. Well, you've had the opportunity now. Let's talk about that. Well, I mean, this has been a challenge of my skill set um, on a number of fronts. As as journalists, we're, we're taught to, to write one style of writing. Um, and then... Um, I started down this road of, of learning to write screenplays. We took a little class, um, read some more books, and that's another form of writing. And then there's documentary writing. Um, and, and in a way, the, the job I um, evolved into is was more training for what I'm, I'm doing now. Uh, I was at the B for 17 years. The pandemic hit was doing the documentary. And then I worked for two years at, at Cap Radio. So learning to write for radio, I think is gonna be more um, training for, for writing the script that will eventually kind of be part of the documentary. I don't, I don't know if there's a narrator or not, but um, in, in any sort of writing for television, I think there's more in common with writing for radio. So I think that's a skill set that's that's been helping me. But you know, the, the other part of it is um, research and and trying to figure out who do we need to talk to, and then the soft skills of trying to get them to to want to talk to you, and then setting up the interviews, and then the the questions you're asking, and the techniques of trying to ask a question that's open ended enough that um, allows them to take the answer where they want to go, but directed enough that it gets the kind of information that you want. And, and then knowing how to not laugh or talk or react over what they're saying and trying to build that rapport without vocally um, participating in the, the, the banter. So it's all been uh, a voyage of discovery. And, and then of course, there's like writing copy for um, business proposals and 
what they call the, the lookbook that describes the project. So a lot more short writing, um, writing things that like maybe a, a, a postcard copywriter um, might be best at versus um, longer form writing like many, most of the authors that, that you talk to. Well, and you know, you mentioned, uh, this is actually something I was gonna ask you about because you know, you mentioned some of the other skills that are necessary in doing this, but the, there, there's even more. I mean, especially when you're in a position like you where you're also uh, producing and you know, hiring directors and, and that kind of thing. There, there's a tremendous amount of um, very, uh, a wide breadth of skill sets that you need to have to be a filmmaker. I know from personal experience, when you're writing a, a novel manuscript, or even a nonfiction manuscript, essentially it's your research and your writing. It's a very singular thing. Whereas a film, I mean, it's a, it's a cliche, but it takes a village to make a film. It's such a big endeavor. How has that transition been? Because, you know, when you're, again, when you're writing a book, you just rely on yourself. Well, now you, you not only have to wear all those hats, you have to rely on a lot of other people to come through as well. That has to be a little challenging for you. Oh, it's definitely uh, the test of, of the skill set. I had done maybe four or five shorts um, before we we started on this project. So some experience there doing uh, production and video work. And, and some of that um, I, I did at the B doing videos for them. Um, but, you know, a, a huge leap and just you know, we, we also created a limited liability company to be able to accept money and working with the lawyer to write the funding agreement. And, you know, it's um, it's 10 jobs that you didn't expect to have and you've got to be proficient in in all of them um, right. unless you've got, got people. You know, it's interesting. I was just talking to a, another colleague who's uh, in the process of, of doing a nonfiction book. And um, it's been a hard sell because it's kind of a tough subject. And uh, I finally got a, got a publisher, but, you know, the advance money is just next to nothing. You know, and, you know, a lot of writers, they count on an advance to, to, to support their life while they, so that they can, you know, commit to finishing the book project. It was so minuscule that that's not even possible. So he's essentially having to go, you know, go fundraise to try to, to, to get the resources to finish the book. And uh, I had the thought when I was hearing this story, it's like, well, that's just like making a film. You're constantly in the state of film of uh, fundraising. So that's a lead into a question of how has the fundraising been for you? Cause that is another thing that re reporters are not, we are not born to be fundraisers, man. That's a, that's asking for money is a tough thing for reporters. How has that been for you learning, learning that skill set, and how has it gone? Uh, I, I would say it's been mixed, um, but better than most. Um, I also, well, I guess a little bit more about my background. I've also been an organizer and involved in structural things for a long time. I was the editor of the paper. I was in student government in high school. I'm uh, significant, not significant in the Burning Man community, but um, a, a leader within the local Burning Man community and used to putting together events and things like that. So that was something else that was kind of in my background that helps on, on this front. But it started small. We did a crowdfunding campaign and raised, uh, I think, $12,000. And that took us to Portland and to Las Vegas. And we were able to create a, a little bit of content and buzz from that. And then from there, we transitioned into a limited liability uh, company. And, um, you know, you start by making a list of all the, the wealthy people, you know, and it's, but how many people do you know that could lose $10,000 and, and wouldn't have to worry about it? Um, because that's what you, you want if you're looking for accredited investors. Um, and, and hopefully those people lead you to more people, but, you know, you've got to knock on every door three times and then find seven new doors when you think you've ran out of doors. Um, it's a, a slog, a labor of love, um, and, and try to find all the help that you can get. But um, in, in, I think in part because of the conditions and the pandemic, we, we ended up not raising the full sum 
that we thought we'd need to do the documentary, but stopped um, in progress and, and was able to uh, form this relationship with a larger company. And uh, should we have distribution, then, then money becomes no problem. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the pandemic has created so many problems. And, you know, for a lot of authors I've talked to, it's been about their book launches or that kind of thing. But um, I, I can imagine it would ha have had a pretty significant impact on somebody doing your kind of project. Um, one thing I'm curious about now, and we've talked about this, the what the story is about. Um, but what was it that has drawn you so strongly to this story that has um, made you feel so committed to seeing it through, uh, through all these challenges, ups and downs and delays and uh, success and backstep and blah, blah. You know, what, what, what about this story has been so appealing for you? I think that it's about um, freedom. It's about self-expression. Um, and these are two things that are kind of at my core. Um, I think I was attracted to it because it, it, it did originate in, in my hometown, but I think I've stayed with it because it's an issue that resonates with my core. Uh, I've been going to Burning Man since 2009. Um, you know, I wasn't, originally, I, I didn't know if I would fit in when I first went, but when I did, it was like, yeah, these are my people. Um, I was a, the kid that was willing to, to dress up and do weird things. Um, in, in junior high and high school. And, and I believe that everybody should be able to be their own individual self. And, and, and that's doesn't mean that you've got to like prescribe to nudity. It, it means that you can be who you want to be. Um, and, and that's inclusive of, of wanting to express yourself without your clothes on. Um, that to me seems like, oh, that, that, that's fine. Um, the, the money part is another equation, but um, I believe in, in letting people um, have their own autonomy over their life uh, decisions to the extent that, that we can in a, in a relative safe way. So I, I think that's why um, I've been able to stick with it. And because almost anybody you tell the story it's inherently interesting. And they're like, oh, I get it. I, I could see that as a movie. I, that seems like a, a great subject to me. Um, it, it would be harder if it were a denser subject and, and people, one out of four, get what you're talking about. But um, people get it when you explain uh, the trial and that the son of the Supreme Court justice, Supreme Court, uh, Chief Chief Justice Earl Warren's son decides that the jury needs to see this dance. It's like, okay, I could see why uh, people are interested in this. So I, I think that's what what fueled me. And I'm and I'm also hard headed. And um, if somebody says it can't be done, then I'm gonna try to break my neck to do it. Ah, uh, yes, yet another quality that's a necessity for being a good reporter. You have to be hard headed. There's no question about stubborn as a mule. That's what we do. Um, this probably doesn't apply anymore because you don't have uh, if since, you know, it's not a piece of fiction anymore, but I do know um, when you certainly when you um, when I when I talk to many writers who are writing stories that do not take place in the here and now, one of the greatest challenges for them is is dialogue, because even in 1969, people were speaking differently than they speak now. Now, at that time, you told me that you had an, and I'm going to semi-quote here, I'm going to paraphrase you, that you had an old guy reading your scripts to make sure you had the dialogue right for the late 1960s time period. Um, <laughs> do you have to do any of that for in the documentary? Or is that, was that, did that get to go away when you moved away from fiction? No, I mean, I think when you when you move away from fiction, I don't have to worry about writing writing dialogue. We're trying to ask the questions and, and let people answer in their own their own words. Uh, we do hope to do the script um, after this is over and and do the the feature film. So, uh, fingers crossed, this will be a, a one two combination, and I can spend not like ten years of my life on this. Maybe we'll spend fifteen. 
<laughs> but you but but you have an old guy lined up to to check that that dialogue for you, right? Well, yeah, we may need new old guys, but we've got one old guy that's uh, still around, <laughs> and um, he'll tell you what you've done wrong. So somebody who was hip in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> By that, somebody who was hip in 1969 is getting pretty old here in 2022. So that might be a little challenging. Yeah, you know, we're we're not we're not. Uh, uh, infallible, not infallible. That's not the, the right word. Yeah, never mind. Um, so, in all of this, have you left daily reporting behind for good? Do you think that this is the new calling for you that will be the permanent calling? Uh, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not um, ashamed of of trading words for money, um, and and will trade words for money in in various forms. Um, but I do want to be the owner of the upside to as many words that I, that I sling. So um, to the extent that I can um, find greater, deeper monetization of my ideas, that's what I'm after. But um, never say never. And, and, I, and I, I, I did work at Cap Radio for a couple of years and, and we'll probably do stories for them in, in the future. So I, I'm, I'm open to it, I'm not above it. And, uh, we do what we got to do. Uh, and then I guess the other aspect of this is, would you ever consider doing this story as a book? Does it lend itself to that? Is it too visual maybe for that medium? Uh, what are your thoughts on that as a possibility? I should have done it as a book first. Um, it's It was the obvious answer. And at the distance I am now, um, I can see that that you know whether it was a short form book about the trial um or a book that encapsulates some of these interviews i've i've had with women across america about sexual expression um so much of that will not make it into the documentary that i was like i should have done this as a as a book um from the beginning um and you know for people that are debating whether or not doing a book makes sense um having a, a proven commodity is a lot easier to sell than uh, a script that that's never had an audience so um for for a lot of reasons i probably could have or should have done it as a book and and won't write off doing it as a book at, at some point sure um just a quick follow-up to something you just said what 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 how would you describe, uh, or, or what can you share from some of those conversations maybe that you've had with women around the country? I mean, what, what has been the response from them when you talk about this issue? Have they generally been supportive of, of how things went uh, in this trial in 69? I mean, what, what, was the, what was the takeaway for you from that? Um, everybody is shocked to, to hear about this judge that took the jury to the club, but they all applaud what he did. Um, they appreciate that he had the, the curiosity to say that no, um, all nudity is not the same. Um, what physically did they do and did in the minds of jurors that violate community standards? Um, and, and not to be kind of graphic or anything, but this was before the poll existed in pole dancing. Um, so, and this this was more akin to go-go without clothes on and psychedelic lights playing behind you. So it uh, we may have our in our minds what a strip tease looked like or what a nude dance looked like, but until you actually saw what they did and where they were and where their customers were. Um, how do you really know whether it violates community standards? Or are we saying that um, nudity in all forms is a violation of community standards? Um, do Is the theater not allowed? Um, what about at a beach? What about um, in a performance? So context does matter. So most people appreciated that they've um, that the judge saw this 
and and we've made a, a, a pretty extensive list uh, of people we'd be interested in talking to about this, uh, top performers from the burlesque world that can share their perspective and how they became a performer, why they do it, and what uh, empowerment they derive from, from this. Uh, we talked to a woman, her, her performer name is, is Cinnamon Love, and she was or is a sex worker and is a sex worker advocate. We talked about um, SESTA FOSTA and these new rules and how the government's efforts to uh, combat sex trafficking is, is help hurting women that have uh, chosen this profession and are, are doing sex work as, as work. Um, so it's been a broad range of conversations. Even we talked to a woman, I'm forgetting her name right now, but she is into uh, doing cyber porn and um, is the owner of a company that's um, kind of on the pioneering front of this new new thing. And, you know, we try to ask questions without judgment um, and, and let them tell their story and um, share their thoughts about this trial and and where society has gone in in the 50 years since this trial and and where we stand in terms of um allowing body autonomy and um, people to choose their own own path well you know i i think it's a fascinating story ed and of course um Having having seen it from I, to some extent from incubation now, just watch, watching you make this progress, I'm I'm cheering you on from the sidelines and hoping that uh, someday you know uh, you'll be standing uh, up on the podium as they're handing off the documentary Oscar uh, to you and your your co-producers. And I can say I knew that guy, man. He did it. <laughs> That's great. I'm, I'm I'm happy for. You. I hope it keeps going. And I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing this because I think a lot of creative folks it's so easy to get down and to get uh, discouraged and to get um, pushed off of, of your goals because it can be so hard to get from A to B. And uh, it takes a lot of intestinal fortitude to keep pushing on and, uh, you know, to overcome challenges and take the victories where you get them and to slough off the losses. So uh, I, like I say, I, it sure sounds like you've made a lot of progress and uh, hopefully that, that'll keep going. Um, I always like to end on, on a, what I hope is a fun question. As I always say, I mean it to be a fun question. So um, let's just say I had the magical power to put you together in a room with any one of the following three people. Which of them would you choose and why? And I'm, I'm going uh, with some very well-known directors. I will, I'll get, your options will be Mario Van Peebles, Jordan Peele, or Ava DuVernay. I hope I said her name right, DuVernay. One of those three, who I can put you together with them for, for dinner, drinks, long talk, I don't care, bike ride, whatever you want. The answer probably should be Ava DuVernay, but I'm going with Jordan Peele. Uh, I have a, a more of a resonance with his recent work and his, his comedy work. Uh, I would love to have a hangout with Jordan Peele. Let me just back up and say one other thing uh, for, for people who are, are listening. Um, the, the production company wants to change the name, so it may come out as something other than Do the Dance. Um, and our social media is Pink Film 1969. That's excellent. And uh, when this does air, as people are watching this now, that will be on the screen in front of them. For So those of you who access this via YouTube that will absolutely be on the uh, the channel or excuse me on the screen in front of you all of all of Ed's uh, social media handles um, so you can get more, keep up to date on what's going on with the film and for those of you listening on the podcast stuff well he just said it <laughs> there you go and we'll keep we'll keep you apprised as things go on because believe me when I if this thing gets some gets uh, gets to the conclusion we'll we'll be uh, we'll be trumpeting its successes as well so ed fletcher thank you again greatly appreciate it uh like i say i think we're all we're all uh, hoping that this um gets exactly where you want it to go so hang in there and we'll be watching until then everybody thank you again for joining 
me, Rich Eisen, here on the Open Mic, Writers in Their Own Words. As I say, if you haven't hit the subscribe button, you should probably do that, because as I say, every week we talk to writers, agents, editors, folks from all around the publishing industry, and hey, sometimes even the filmmaking industry, uh, about uh, what they do, their work, and how they do it. And so until uh, next time, just remember, uh, tomorrow is not promised to any of us, so uh, do your best to make today count. Until then, talk to you soon.